this uh, this idea for today's session came up about a year ago when I first um, accepted being the co-chair for this team. And it was kind of my naive, um, you know, first thought, okay, this is a collaboration group, so we must have NGOs well represented in this um, IRP collaboration team. And Sarah Bowden at the time said, well, actually, no, they're not. They're not engaging as much as we'd like them to. So um, we designed this idea to come up, you know, invite folks from the NGO uh, to talk to um, IRPIC. And particularly on this team, I think NGOs serve an important role in general for um, environmental uh, resource management in, in terms of providing capability to analyze information. Um, and I was particularly interested in um, data, but also tools. And so I reached out to Jim about a year ago and um, invited him prematurely. Then we went on furlough and, and things happened after that. So we've been busy up until now. And then uh, I reached out to Max Goldman, actually Audubon, Alaska, and um, invited them to present on their um, marine um, synthesis efforts. So um, that was actually recommended by Allison Gaylord at our last meeting. So that was kind of a quick turnaround. Last month it was recommended that happen and um, just gave me the opportunity to follow through on that initial idea we had a year ago. So I really would like to touch on at the end the role that NGOs have in IRPIC and Arctic data management. And I hope through displaying these two examples of these capabilities these NGOs provide, that'll give us the springboard to have that discussion. So feel free at any time during your talks to, to speak to that issue. So um, without further ado, first we have Max Goldman and uh, for the Arctic Marine Synthesis. Great, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, this is uh, the topic of this discussion is especially uh, apropos to sort of the way that we think about the work that we do in our organization and uh, the ways that we uh, build relationships uh, and just go about our, our business. So um, I'll, I'll kind of make sure everybody can see what I'm seeing right now. Does that's does that look right? Can everybody see the a title screen? Looks good. Right now? Yeah, great. Great. Um, so I, I'm hoping that some of you ha are uh, familiar with this work already, um, because if, if not, then we didn't do a good enough job of telling people about it. But um, whether you know it or not, a lot of you um, contributed to this, um, or the data you manage, uh, the, or the organizations, agencies that you work for. Um, contributed to it. But what, what I'll be talking to you about today briefly is uh, the making of a, a project that we finished up in 2017 and then have been continuing uh, work with in various ways since then called the Ecological Atlas of the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas. Um, just very briefly, um, as a sort of an intro to, to the NGO that, that I'm representing today, um, I work for Audubon Alaska. We are under the umbrella of the National um, Audubon Society, which is based in New York. Um, we're one of the 24 state offices. We've been working in, so there's the National Audubon, which these state offices, and then there's also the, the Audubon chapters, which are like the bird clubs uh, that uh, my grandmother belonged to when I was a kid and kind of got me into birding, but there's, there's, there's like 700 of those across the U.S. So there's various layers of engagement. Um, in Alaska, we've been operating for the last, what was our 42nd year of work in conservation. And, and because of the nature of, of land ownership in the state, we work mostly in the conservation of public lands, uh, which means that we work really closely with uh, federal and state agencies, as well as the uh, university system within Alaska and other um, academia entities uh, that are gathering data and collecting data within the state. This is our little vision statement that we put together pretty recently, which I think sounds really cool. Um, through enhanced understanding of Alaskans map the path toward living better with birds. Um, and that harkens a little bit to what 
the way that we've used our work, um, uh, the way that we've worked towards conservation within the state of Alaska over the last uh, four plus decades, which has been utilizing spatial ecology um, and, and using the data that are gathered by um, agency personnel, academics, um, other NGOs, for instance, but really any data that exists. Um, and, and for a long time, that was anything you could find, uh, the data um, scape within the state had been pretty pretty poor for a long time. I think um, in some earlier work that, that we did that came out in 2010, the first line is we know more about the, the surface of Venus than we do about the bathymetry of Arctic seas. So that's changed a lot. Um, the data scape has improved quite a bit and, and that's represented in this uh, atlas that I'm gonna talk to you about. And uh, this is a synthesis product. Um, we don't collect any data ourselves. We, we do, you know, a little bit of, of uh, migratory bird stuff, uh, very little um, and very local at that. And it's mostly citizen science based, more community engagement than it is robust data collection efforts. Um, and so what we're doing is gathering and using the data that exists already. Um, and so what that means is that we really collect data collectors in a lot of ways. Um, and this, this effort engages with many different ways of knowing many different data types, which I'll get into. But the importance of those, the, this, the synthesis, synthesis products to me and to Audubon Alaska starts really with accessibility. Um, it's not necessarily the mandate of most agencies to uh, make the work that they do especially accessible to the public. Um, sometimes that can, it can even be really locked up in jargon um, and, and the, the audience is not um, again, my grandmother sitting on her couch, um, she, were she to have access to a database where she could get, ac get access to some of these data, or now it's more and more becoming available on agency websites, she still probably wouldn't know how to dig through um, or how to get much out of those reports often, which uh, that, that can, you know, that's because she's not a, a manager. She's not a, a decision maker in that field. Um, and so that's not what the, the data collection effort was geared towards. So one of the things that we really want to do is to, to make those data more accessible by the public. Another, and this was one that was sort of surprising to me when we, when we started this work was actually as a, a reference for, uh, often an off-discipline reference for other scientists that work in this um, field. We'll see people show up to meetings and they'll have our atlas with, with them, which makes me feel really good. But, um, you know, if you study ice seals uh, and you're interested in knowing what some of the nuance in bowhead whale movements in the in the Chukchi Sea um, in the fall, that can be something that would be really nice to have a one-stop uh, shop to find that information. So the, this kind of synthesis work can serve that purpose as well. Um, another is hopefully you, you know, we want informed uh, decisions made by informed policymakers. And so trying to make some of that information available and easy to access is really important. Um, and then there's this other component of, of this is sort of a line in the sand of what we know at this point, the best available data to describe the movements and relative abundances um, of many of the Arctic species, Arctic marine species, as well as, as some of the abiotic processes in this region. So just to, just briefly, the this is a regional overview map from the atlas um, to kind of show our project area. And so we we covered the Bering, um, the Chukchi, and the Beaufort in in uh, as much as we could. That included um, some transboundary data gathering. So we include Russian data where we could find it. Um, there are various uh, uh, data quality concerns and and accessibility concerns with with data in both Canada and in Russia, and honestly in parts of Alaska too, but um, we did the best that we could to find those data. Um, there were some, we, we got a lot of help from some folks who were really generous with their time across the board. Um, so we, we covered a really a massive geography. And this this atlas builds on a, a, an effort that we, we completed in 2010, uh, marine synthesis that was much narrower in scope in, in geography and in, in, in scope and the species that were covered. Um, so we had a baseline for part of the geography for the Chukchi and Beaufort just in US waters. And so we expanded that to include areas outside of that region as well as 
um, added some more species and, and improved on the data that we had for the species that were included in the first effort. And this is the first page, so I'm, I'm just going to use my 15 minutes to go page by page through this 350 page document, um, which I'm sure I'll just work out just fine. Um, but uh, honestly, I, I wanted to include this page because it's one that of which I'm the most proud um, because of all of the the agencies and organizations, and this is just a few um, that we worked with and that, that really put in a massive amount of time and effort and capacity to make this happen. Um, we worked with Coeric uh, to integrate some traditional knowledge data in the Bering Strait region um, that they represent, which is was a new experience for me um, to integrating uh, Western science data with traditional knowledge data. Um, Federal agencies were especially helpful. Alaska Department of AD, uh, of uh, Fish and Game was also really helpful. And then BOEM reviewed the entire report as well. Um, and then that AUS, the Alaska Ocean Observing System, that's a really important collaboration that I'll get to um, towards the end that, that um, really shows you, that you guys can engage with on your own that, that, that put this atlas in a, f a digital format that people are able to navigate through and kind of curate their own experience. And this whole process was done in collaboration with Oceana from the beginning, from scoping and, and beyond. And so they, they were especially important to, to this process. And of course, all of this is funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So gratitude to that foundation for their, their dedication to Arctic science. So the, forgive my rudimentary graphics here, but the, um, the chapters that are covered, we introduce the, the region and the project, and then we go through the physical setting, the abiotic components of the, the ecosystem, including the climate, um, sea ice, um, uh, and a few other components. The biological setting is the lower trophic organisms. Um, then we cover some fishes. Um, we're Audubon, so there's a, a robust birds chapter, and um, marine mammals as well. And then we focus on human uses. So that includes things like vessel traffic, um, subsistence, um, transportation, infrastructure, um, conservation and management areas, um, and, and beyond, and, and a few other topics as well. And then we end it with a conservation summary, which are our words outside of those collaborations and partnerships about what we think all of this means and what we think should be done uh, with this information in hand. So the, the parts of an ecological atlas are you, you start with the science um, and those, those science, uh, uh, the science is conducted elsewhere by others. Um, and we jump in right there in between, uh, uh, right, right at, at stage two, hopefully right after they've gathered their data and processed it. And then we come in and we're really nice and um, we've got a track record of doing a pretty good job with data. So we've had a lot of, of incredible access to to data and to review. And that's a really, really important component of this atlas is that every single map, every summary was reviewed by at least one uh, um, expert in that field. And throughout the process, there were many, many more that were engaged in uh, to make sure that we were using their data in a way that makes sense. Um, that this, when we rescale data, you know, if you gather data at a certain scale and then we're, we're upscaling for it to fit into our project area to make sure that the way that we're um, using those data is appropriate to the way that they were collected and um, when we're using them in conjunction with other data that that, that um, composite use is also appropriate. So there was engagement with PIs throughout this process and then again at the review stage. Um, so that was really an important component. Um, so after we've got those data and we may make maps, then we look for patterns and that's sort of some of the continuing work that's happening. Um, I've just completed a, another two-year project called uh, an assessment of ecological value and vulnerability in the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas, which will be um, out here very shortly. And that's, uh, we took the, the data that exists within the atlas that, that I'm, I'm explaining to you guys today, and then analyzed that to identify areas of ecological value um, across these taxonomic groups that were covered in, in the atlas chapters. And then, uh, compared those data to some anthropogenic uses within the same uh, geography uh, as a metric for vulnerability. If there's high ecological value and high vessel traffic value, for instance. What we're saying is that there's the potential for 
um, impacts by vessel traffic on ecological values. Um, so that's you know one one effort, one way that you can use these data. And there are, there are many others. The whole process of sort of making this atlas we call the data to design process. Um, and we gather data, synthesize it, and then go through that conservation design um, component. And the first steps are we have to identify these available data. And the main data that we use are um, colony data, like census count data for, for uh, breeding bird colonies, um, surveys and transects, um, the ATSI and aerial surveys, uh, telemetry, uh, so the geolocator, um, satellite locator data, um, and then also expert knowledge, and that's local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and eBird. Uh, eBird's tricky to use because it's really, just really tells us what we know about where birds are when there are people that use eBird there also. Uh, but that can be valuable in extending range maps, um, et cetera. It can be interesting when looking at migration patterns as well. So then there's uh, acquiring and organizing data. I'm going to skip the database management component of this. Um, if you guys are really interested in that, um, I feel some sympathy for you, but also I'm, uh, I'm happy to talk about that um, at any time. But kind of what our very, very crudely, what our process looks like is we can take data from, say, um, some colony data and the YK Delta, um, and then also take some king eider or some you know, breeding bird surveys that were done um, on the north slope and then look at some some traditional knowledge that shows wintering areas of the same species um, and then you know use some satellite tracking data to show staging and migration patterns and sew all of those various data types together to make a single map of a species um, we then also, when possible, we look at um, what we know about the intensity of use and we'll categorize or classify those data based on, on the intensity of use where you can have the extent of range, uh, regular use areas, then getting, getting more specific concentration and then high concentration. That's the strategy we use throughout the Atlas. And then if we know even more than that, we can even break the, the map up into different activity types and apply that same intensity matrix to various activities. Um, and and, and I, I get, I'm, I'm going sort of fast through this, but there's a lot to cover. But one of the things that you end up with is a map, and this is kind of the King Eider map, going through many iterations of review and also of uh, where we found more data and refined our process and in, in showing those data on the same map. Um, and once you kind of get everything together and you figure out how you can sew all of these things together, um, you end up with a map that hopefully when you look at it, you get a general idea of where are king eiders. And then if you look a little bit more um, closely, you get where are king eiders and what are they doing? And if you drill even farther in, you can say where are king eiders, what are they doing and how many of them are there spread out throughout these things. And then if you look even more closely, you can figure out how they got there and, and um, how they left. And so hopefully we've got this onion-like quality to these maps where there's a way to engage at multiple different levels and there's value in all of those levels. And it's not just a hodgepodge of information that no one wants to look at because it's super complicated and there's all those hatch marks going in different directions and all that stuff. So hopefully it's, uh, we're successful in, in the cartography of that. So bear with me for a minute. So one of the things I really wanted to talk about, and I, I just want to spend a couple minutes on this and then open this up to questions, is the AUS um, Alaska Ocean Observing System. So we went through this process of making the atlas. Um, I think there's 150 maps over 350 pages with summaries that cover each of those, uh, each of the maps or each of the, the, the species um, included. Then we spent a bunch of time working with Axiom Data Science here in Anchorage and the AUS um, Arctic Data Portal to um, sort of translate those, those static maps into something that's interactive and digital so that you can go through and look at those data, anyone can go through, download the data that we have the right to share, um, and then also engage with those data on this Arctic Portal. And I'll, if you'll bear with me, I'll just kind of 
show you what that looks like briefly. So this is the landing page on the previous Arctic data portal for the Atlas. And we spent a lot of time working to uh, make sure that the symbology that exists within the Atlas, because we'd spent so much time on cartography, but the symbology within this. Um, uh, hey, Max. Uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, it sounds like your voice is breaking out a little bit. Will you um, maybe just stop your video and maybe that'll help with the bandwidth issue? Oh, yeah, sure. Good idea. No worries. Thanks. Yeah, is this is this better? Yeah, yeah. Please do tell me if I'm if you guys can can't hear me. Um, yeah, can you, uh, much better. Okay, great. So anyway, these are those those chapters um, that exist, and then um, for the sake of time, and I'll I'll make sure that everyone gets a link to this. Um, I just wanted to show you kind of some of the ways that we use those. Um, so if this is we have a Pacific Walrus map. Um, actually, we have two maps for seasonality. Um, but you know, there's, you, it, it also is interesting to look at Pacific walrus and their food, which we have represented in the Atlas as benthic biomass. Um, and so you can put those, those maps together. You can put those various layers together. You can change transparencies, you can engage with those data. You could also pile on bowhead whale and whatever else you wanted to look at, or maybe more appropriately gray whale, since they're also a benthic forager. Um, and you could kind of look at how the distribution of their resource and the distribution of the the walrus um, interact with each other. Um, you could also you know, do that in, in various ways. This is vessel traffic and um, vessel traffic in September and bowhead whale fall relative abundance. So you get an idea just very, very rudimentarily about where the areas of interaction between this anthropogenic use and um, whales are seasonally. Um, and then, you know, you, another thing, and this is, you know, these were just ones I threw together um, you can look at forage fish and um, diving piscivores, I think this is, and, and, and marine bird colonies. So forage fish and piscivores to see how the distribution of uh, fish eating birds and the distribution of those fish um, interact with each other. And so anyway, these are just a few of the ways that, that we're using these maps um, so we can respond to things that are in the news. Uh, we can be really nimble about moving those data out and we also don't have to to go through um, uh, you know another cartographic process and it's all online which is really really cool I think and so we're we're, we're excited about the possibilities um, of this portal and uh, are hoping that that as we do a more public launch of this which is upcoming that uh, this will get uh, quite a bit more use but um, anyway with that uh, I'll stop I, I apologize for using so much time but I'd love uh, to be able to answer some questions if there are some so thank you for your time. And yeah, thank you, Max. That um, I I don't know if I saw different versions of the maps, but the ones you showed look really great. The static ones, I mean, I think it's more than cartography. There, You're, you got some aesthetic. You need, you need to have a graphic designer almost involved in balancing the elements in that. And then, um, w were you able to reproduce one of your maps? on the AU's portal, so you'd had, have the arrows as well, or is it, are you just looking at the data in that sense, not the information? Yeah, so we went through, so the, you, like the, you, by arrows, you mean like the migration arrows? Yeah, the one that said fall or spring. Yeah, yeah we have all of those on there also. So that was actually a, a challenge. Um, part of it is you're, you're moving something from uh, ArcGIS or, or potentially, um, and in, in our case, we do a lot of our, our cartography work in Adobe Illustrator, um, where you have all of these, you, you know, you're working with different ways of organizing information than what exists in the digital format. So we had to make all of those arrows into essentially polygons um, and then put them up. So, but we have, what we wanted to do was keep the color scheme and the um, hue saturation and the design of those arrows uh, as as similar as possible to the atlas so that you could get as close as possible to putting stacking all the data that you found in a static map within the atlas stacking all those same data together to show and and it, and it would resemble something similar and there's projection system issues that that make it so there's everything's a little bit different but it's similar enough I, I, it's much more similar than i thought 
honestly was possible in something that has as much functionality as is do, as as does the the AUS Arctic data portal, and that's a, a real testament to the Axiom data science folks and the the AUS portal. They've got a they're doing a really excellent job. The other thing I was thinking when I saw the static map was um, this would be a great story map. You know, if you've seen those Esri products, because you are telling a complex story, so you could span those arrows so they pop up, come in and come out of focus when you're going through the story. Yeah, that's a great point. That story maps are, are uh, uh, a product, Esri product that we've used in the past. Um, we've done a little bit of that with the Atlas when we did the first Atlas launch. I think we went through what the Atlas was and what the functionality and, and the utility of, the, of that might be um, through some story mapping. There really are pretty incredible. They also can be sort of, they take a lot of time to build and they can be um, hard to, to uh, do really well. There are people who do a really good job with them and we, we've I've never done a really good job. There's other folks I work with who've done a, who put them in. But one of the one of the problems, the reason we do a lot of cartography outside of, as there's there's still some some design uh, function and and just general design paucity uh, that exists within Arc. There's there's a there's a Arc um, quality to maps, and you can kind of tell when the cartography was done in Arc. I I am really creative, so I call it. Archie, that map looks very archy, but um, that that's something that we're trying to work around. And story maps work especially well if, uh, if everything was done within Arc. Um, what we would be doing more of is is moving them in just basically as a JPEG, as a as an image. And there's value in that also, especially in storytelling, um, which is obviously is what those are for. But man, you can do a lot more um, when you've got that that whole product was made within Arc, and that's something that we've done in previous atlases. Uh, we did an atlas of Southeast Alaska uh, that I recommend you take a look at. And all of those maps were made in ARC. Um, I think they are very beautiful. Um, and that lend itself to story mapping much more easily. Cool. Hey, uh, do we have any questions on the phone for Max? Hi, this is Allison. Um, I just wanted to comment and uh, thank you guys for the fabulous job you've done on this atlas and and also for making the information available even in its you know more preliminary states and before the atlas was released to some of the work I've done up here in Alaska. Um, but one thing I went, was one question I had is what is the direct link to the online access um, atlas that's hosted by AOS? I, I didn't catch that. If, if somebody could put it in the chat. Yeah, I'll I'll make sure to send that out. So that's not it's not fully live yet. Um, it's all all complete, but we're doing some uh, some work. Uh, so it's not something by by it's not live. It's not something you could find by searching on the AUS Arctic portal yet. But I'll share that link with you guys because it is complete. Um, so I'll send that along, and you can feel free to share it. We just have, we're going to do a kind of a you know hopefully make a little bit of a splash with that release because it, it's been a long time coming, but it's been worth it. So uh, I'll make sure to send that to the group. Um, um, when we're, we've uh, completed the day. Fantastic. It's really great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison. Yeah, I agree. Great work, Max. Um, and Jonathan, thank you so much for bringing Alaska Audubon into the mix here. Um, I just have a question about how often you guys update these atlases that you produce. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, why do you have a box full of money that you can give me so we can keep them updated uh, more regularly? Um, it, that's, a, that's a great question. That, and that's something that we, we keep in mind. So the, our hope, we, we run our third version of a Western Arctic Terrestrial Atlas, and that's been updated about every um, um, five years. And then our Southeast Atlas, we, were, we did our first version of that um, in 2016. This atlas, this is the second version, though it's been expanded in the ways I mentioned in my presentation. Um, and I think it was six years in between that expansion, but really five years in between completion of the first and the beginning of funding uh, of the second. And so what we're hoping for is in five years or less, you know, as, as we all know, um, at least all of 
all the folks who are up here in Alaska, but anybody who's anywhere in the, on the globe knows things are changing much more quickly than ever. Um, and that's also true of the data scape. So uh, it, was, it took five years for there to be new enough data for us to, to warrant a full reboot of this atlas. And that won't be the case uh, moving forward. Data are coming in at much, much more rapidly, even, even with budget cuts to a lot of the um, agencies and some cuts to some long-term monitoring programs, which is always a shame to see. But um, I, I'm hoping that funding contingent will be able to, to do this again in the next couple of years, at least get started. I mean, it's a, it's a two-year process. So this, this atlas from even though we'd done one in, up to 2010 for two of the Cs that were included, um, and, we had, and we've been keeping up with data gathering pretty well um, throughout that time, it took us two years to, to from start to finish to get this out the door. So it's a pretty robust undertaking no matter what. My, my ideal goal would be to get these online um, in a really slick format where they could be updated regularly. So when we had, an, had new data, we could just pop it into the map. Um, or when someone we learned something new about the Arctic Turn, for instance, so now we know where they winter much more uh, uh, with some much more confidence. We could just uh, edit that that um, summary instead of redoing the entire thing and spending all of that time to make a, something that at the end is a static map. And that it's really cool to have the this this book of all of these maps and stuff, but it also weighs eight pounds. So. <laughs> There's there's better ways to be moving data and moving information around. So we're, we're I'm my short answer is five years. My long answer is hopefully we're going to totally change the way we do these things in the future, and it'll be much easier to update on a much more regular basis. Hi, this is Peter uh, at um, at NASA Goddard, uh, and forgive me if I uh, if I missed this detail uh, and you mentioned it, but. Um, uh, there's a data uh, source called MoveBank uh, mm -hmm. that uh, has a lot of uh, information on migratory uh, animals. And, um, and I'm wondering if, uh, if you draw upon that or if it's connected in any way or uh, what, um, what uh, connections there might exist. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that question, Peter. And I didn't address that. Um, MoveBank is something I am aware of. Um, National Audubon is working right now on, on a broad, uh, multi-phased, up to a, maybe a 10-year um, migratory bird um, project. And MoveBank uh, plays a, a role in that. But we were able to use some MoveBank data that existed and then uh, convince some of our data um, contributors to contribute to uh, MoveBank's data also. So we, we've we worked with folks at MoveBank um, kind of get, taking from them and, and, and also um, steering people towards that resource to, to add to some of the existing data that, that are there. But there's a lot of value. What, what, what worked the best for me was we had our data needs were uh, – different than often what MoveBank has available, but what I, I was able to do is identify who to talk to often through MoveBank. So I was able to look at those data, see who's contributing them, who's doing this work, um, who's got spatial data, um, which is what we specifically need. And then um, I you know, could contact folks that maybe um, I missed going through the literature or that other folks hadn't, hadn't uh, told me about but uh yeah that thanks for for that plug too that's a really great resource if anyone's not familiar with move bank it's a, a an incredible clearinghouse of of migration data it's a pretty incredible place all right um i think we need to move over into jim talk thank you so much max for your contributions and i encourage everyone to continue the conversation on the irpet collaboration website yeah, and just just briefly, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email me anytime, um, max.goldman at audubon.org. Um, I'm happy to, to talk about this for, for days and days. But yeah, thank you very much for, for the time. All right. Hey, Kelly, am I on? All right, go for it, Jim. Okay, uh, do you want me to turn on video or do you want me to improve bandwidth and just stay voice only? 
Uh, that's up to you. Go for it. Okay. I'll put video on for a little bit. If it starts causing a problem, let me know, and I will shut that part down. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, I could talk for days on this, and I have 15 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to be uh, as, as uh, careful with my time as possible. Um, I, my name is Jim Strittle, and I'm, I'm the founder of the Conservation Biology Institute. And our main office is in Corvallis, Oregon, but we have people spread out in a variety of different geographies. Um, we started we started CBI in 1997, actually, so we've been around a long time. Um, sometimes it feels like a few years, and sometimes it feels like a few lifetimes. Um, but what I want to talk to you, to you guys about, and the bulk of our work is ecological assessments and conservation planning. That's where we have our strengths, but we have a lot of different disciplines that interconnect. And in 2007, and we so and we do a lot of computer mapping, remote sensing, and computer mapping in our work. And so. Um, in 2007, we had a request from one of our, our foundation friends, and they were asking if we could, since we do a lot of planning and we do a lot of computer mapping, they, they wanted to know if there was a way to build something that would allow their grantees, and at that point there was their grantees, in a way of, of learning from each other and maintaining the work that they're constantly funding instead of having work funded and have it be a one-off exercise. And then we would lose the data and lose the learning along the way and we'd be returning to do it yet again. And so that's kind of the, 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 the nucleus of the idea that came about in 2007. And these were the four basic tenants. And at the time I had one programmer on my staff, I now have seven, um, and it, it became obvious to me right away that there was a lot of learning that we had to do. Uh, these were the four basic tenants, and I'll go over those very quickly. Um, they wanted to really increase data accessibility, and there's a lot of aspects to that. They wanted to provide a, in the means for data and information integration on the web. That was another requirement. Of course, they wanted it to be uh, extremely scientific robust, but they also wanted it to be easy to use. So non-technical, non-science people could use this. And I have to say the biggest one is the last one, is they wanted to support collaboration. Now, I want to talk about two things briefly, and then I'll show you the system live. Um, the, the, uh, I, before we did any code writing at all, I, I, we spent six months just talking to people. How do they go about doing what they do? What are some of the, the uh, hurdles, the social barriers? Um, and I looked at other efforts that are similar or close to what we were trying to create. And I asked the question as to, well, are they still around? And the answer was no. And I started to figure out, well, then why did they fail? And most of these were large government efforts, and they all failed. And I thought, okay, now they've evolved into other things, and that's ongoing, as you all know. Um, and I tried to understand why, and they didn't fail technically at all. Um, I think they failed socially. And so I spent a lot of time, and it's really easy for GIS geeks like me and others to get all wrapped around the axle on the data and how to process the data and how to format the data and big data, little data, all of that. And in that, in that space, we forget what we're building the data for and who we're building it for. And so we spent a lot of time, and we, can, we continue to spend a long time thinking about, well, who's going to use this? Uh, I always think as database and as sort of a connective tissue between science, technology, and people who make decisions, whether they're politicians, well, usually it goes to political aides because politicians wouldn't spend their time here, um, all the way to citizen science or just regular people who want a better future and they want to participate in it. And they're frustrated because they can't get access to either the data or it's, un or it's, it's underpinning knowledge and they're hungry for it. And we're seeing that play out a lot right now because there's a lot of people very interested in citizen science kind of activities. Um, I want to spend a few minutes on definitions because I think it's really important. Um, in today's world, when there's maps everywhere on the web, Everybody thinks if it has a map, it's the same, and it's not. And I want to point out these are my definitions that I use to help keep myself straight as to what are we building and what is it intended to do. So I'm going to go through three. I'm going to talk about applications, briefly on models and platforms, 
and use the database and as the platform example, and then I'll jump to the life system. Um, applications, there are lots and lots of them. And this is generally how they are constructed, and we do a lot of applications as well. Um, they're usually designed to educate or inform people. Uh, it's usually a targeted audience. Um, the information, sometimes they're used as an information or data retrieval system. Um, they are becoming increasingly sophisticated and interactive, um, and they have very limited user control. And usually the data that's underneath all this is very well contained. There isn't a, an option for it to, to continue to develop over time. And these have great value, but this is what they're intended to do. Models, many of you on the call or your colleagues do lots of models. Species distribution models, migration models, hydrologic models, uh, all variety of synthetic models. And there to me, is a, that's a different category as well. Some of them produce maps. Some of them are online. This is one of the softwares that we wrote called Eames Online, which allows people to create models together, and then they produce results that can then be published. Um, they're designed to synthesize data. Um, they, in this case, they're highly targeted. Um, they usually are created by subject experts, and if they have any user control, it's quite limited. Now, the last one in all platforms, and I'll talk about database and as the example here. Uh, platforms are a lot more complicated to build, and they have they almost get a life of their own, and I'll explain why in a little bit. The, the purpose of database is to integrate and curate content, and it's a growing endeavor. It's not a one-off exercise. We, we first launched this in 2010, so we've been around a while, and it continues to grow, and the speed at which it's growing is, is picking up. Um, we need to make sure in our system, we want to make sure that the users who are there have a, tremendous amount, of con a tremendous amount of control. The control they have is what they get to see, how they want to create it, who they want to share it with, how they want to share it, all becomes really important social part of the system. I would say database and it was as much of a social experiment as a technical one. Did we solve a lot of technical problems? Yes, and we continue to, to tackle others. But it's the social stuff, which I think is the Achilles heel of all this stuff. There's always going to be another mousetrap, and it's going to be bigger and better than the previous ones. But if we don't get the sociology right, it's going to fall largely. You're going to be speaking to each other and not talking to the people who need this information desperately. Um, we needed to make this thing easy to use. And we, as I mentioned earlier, we need to really support the collaboration. And since we're a science organization, we really wanted to build in a lot of science guidance, and not just from us, but from our colleagues and uh, collaborators, to make this really useful to people. Um, one last, two last slides, and then I'll go to the live. Um, and while it's easy to get hung up on data, yes, data is critical. It's the currency of this system. But it isn't the only thing that matters. And so these are the different kinds of content that we manage in the platform. Uh, so yes, we have lots of data and it's growing every day. Yes, we have lots of registered members and it's growing every day of about 20 to 25 new members a day right now. Um, but we have groups that people create to work together. We have almost 1,000 now. Um, guides and case studies that are written by us or others that will explain how do you go about doing this. We have atlases in here. Uh, so it has a permanence, so there's a record, and we, make, we take great pains to make sure that things get branded for the authors. Um, all of the contributors get, uh, and it can't be separated from the data. There's lots of safeguards to allow people to feel safe working in the platform. Uh, galleries are collections of data and maps, the maps themselves, and so on. Now, one, another thing that's quite different from a lot of I would call web applications, is that when you join database and you have a private workspace. So as you do your work, you can save it, share it, and come back to it anytime you want, and it's where you left it. And so it's not just a you go visit, you grab something, and off you go. You come in, you work, it stays, and you continue to build on whatever you want it to build on. Um, and that's a huge advantage, and it's a private workspace, so you can control the privacy as well. Now, 
I'm going to go live for just a couple minutes, and I'll, I'll end with one more slide because I'd like to tell you where we're going next. Um, so database, and when I talked to the original funders, I said, you know, this is not unique to the Pacific Northwest. I said, this is a global thing because we work all over the world, and it's a global problem. People can't get access to the data, and if they can get it, they can't figure out how to use it, and if they can't figure out how to use it, it's just a lot of hard work from a lot of really good professional people, and it's not getting to the people who need to see it and to use it to make the world a better place. Um, but database was too big of an idea, and people loved the concept, but they wanted their own thing. They wanted their own uh, platform, so we came up with a concept called gateways. And so gateways are database and um, customized to whoever wants to customize. And it's usually in a particular geography or and or a theme, whether it be climate. And here's one on bat acoustic monitoring. So this is a bunch of bat researchers in North America. Uh, we have these things ordered by state government, local government, federal government, NGOs, universities, um, a whole variety of things. Now. I'll show you one. This one we created for the California Energy Commission. And not only did they want this one, but they have other gateways that they ordered. Uh, here's the newest one on offshore wind development for California. So it's curated in a way that allows people to stay focused, in this case, on two things, the marine, envir the marine environment off the coast of California and renewable energy, in particular wind. Um, and so it engages all of the various stakeholders or interested parties, industry, NGOs, fishermen, uh, utility companies, regulators, the list goes on, about trying to come up with solutions where everybody can benefit from it and do it in a much smarter way. Um, I, I won't have time to get into the details here, but I do want to show you one map. But before I do that, um, I wanted to give you an idea that so database isn't just one thing. <laughs> so yes, we have these different gateways and you, you're free to explore them all. Many of them have applications that sit on top of them. Here's one example. We have one on climate change for California. Here's another one that is highly analytical. Um, I don't have time to go into the details, but I invite you to take a look on your own. It's very intuitive, uh, very powerful and it's been becoming increasingly popular. Now we're being asked to do this in other parts of the country right now. Um, and I'm also also happy to anyone on this call, if you wanna have a, another uh, webinar or get together, please just let me know and I'm happy to show you in greater detail. Um, so the way these are gonna interact, so think of it is there's an interaction between the database and platform, which is best thought of as a workbench for people to work together to pull things together in new ways and come up with better solutions. And we have to lower the barrier for participation. We, yeah, we have a lot of academics, we have a lot of scientists working here, but they're not working here in, in terms of analysis. They're, they're publishing their stuff so their work becomes more, more relevant to more people, and that's really important for folks. So let me go, in fact, one of the gateways, we have one for Alaska when the LCC program was was funded. We've kept this alive, um, even though the program is, is currently no more. Um, and I wanted to give you an example of one of our maps, and then I will stop. Um, so here's one uh, I just created for this, this presentation. Uh, it's GIS Lite for the web. Yes, we have analytical tools. I won't get into those. Um, we had to make this to be really easy for people to do. Um, yes, there are different base maps. I can click them on and off as I wish. Um, I can, uh, there's data sets that I can create. Um, uh, I create my map, whatever I want to pick from. I can load my own data. I don't have to rely on us. You can load however much data you want as long as it's public. Um, the, here's some that I, I grabbed off the atlas just the other day. So here's one on polar bear maternal dens. Um, I can put in whatever I want here. I can, here's a, another one. Here's the station, uh, biological important areas. Here's one for fire history. Um, we can serve the, rep we can store the data on our cloud servers for people who don't have the capacity to do it. Or we'll just pull in, this one happens to be a map service that we just pull in. Um, the, the goal is not to host everybody's data. The goal is to integrate the data in a way that 
normal people can use it in creative ways, and that's really what we're trying to do. Um, I'll grab, uh, let me just grab something uh, real quick. So here's uh, uh, important bird areas. And, if, and, and we have commenting tools for people, and they can go in and you can zoom in on a spot, and then you could say, okay, I want to uh, comment on a new, say you're working with colleagues, and you decide who gets to see the map. I don't know why it's taking so long to refresh. There we go. Um, and I can add comments. The comments can be in a private space, or they can be in a public sphere. And you could say, uh, and then you type in, you know, oh, well, I don't understand this one, whatever, whatever. It will keep an ongoing log of all the comments that people want to make. Um, and we've used this a lot. We've even used it for official public comment on EIRs from the federal government. And rather than having long letters with hard to read print, um, people could actually go online, add their comments. You can actually download it, and then they could put it in with their official comment letters. So it was quite uh, useful. Um, I'll end with one last slide, and I know this has really been fast. Um, this is where we're going now. Um, we're expanding the file formats to increase integration. We've been talking to Google lately, and we want to include uh, QGIS, which is more, more popular in the developing world. Database is global. Um, we want to include uh, new monitoring approaches and sensors more directly, whether they be temperature sensors, acoustic sensors, whatever. Um, trying to get in the monitoring aspects and not just assessing and planning, but building in the feedback loops. Sort of what Max was talking about is trying to have things more dynamically updated so we learn faster because things are moving quickly, right? Um, we want to fully integrate other applications and models, not just applications and models that we build, but that anybody builds. It really doesn't matter. The whole idea is to expand the community of practice and get it into the hands of people who need to see this stuff. Um, and the last one is that we're starting to talk about how do we incorporate AI applications, which I'll say one last thing about that is um, there's, there's a lot of buzz, of course, about big data and artificial intelligence stuff. But I think we need to be careful here um, for this reason. Not that it isn't fabulously great and extremely potentially beneficial. Um, if, we don't, if we're not careful, we will not get support from the public. They won't believe it if we're not careful about bringing people along to help them understand, increase the transparency and understanding, then it will actually have the impact that everybody hopes and dreams it will. So with that, I know we're nearly out of time, and I will stop. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, that, that's a, a very impressive set of tools you've developed. and. Um, yeah, I was aware of the um, the cooperative um, site going down, and that's unfortunate. But I uh, just wanted to recognize your contributions, your your organization's contributions to that, and um, and definitely for other regions, that's still an active area of of interest. So, um, any questions for Jim before we have to get off? Yeah, um, I guess I'll ask one question. Um, so I was, I was um, just looking at the individualized, um, the, what did you call them, portals, or they're like a smaller database in, in Yeah, we call, them, we call them gateways, but people call them whatever they want to call them. We don't really care. Um, and they're very customized. I mean, there's, um, they have, there's one for a county. Where's the, where's Kern County at? I just saw it. Um, we have Santa Barbara County. Um, right. Do they feed case. back into your overall database? Then so they're yeah, just they're yeah yeah great question yeah they're all federated so everything is interconnected. Um, now people can elect to stay in their sandbox as they wish. Sorry about that. I was clicking too fast. Um, they can elect to stay entirely within a particular gateway of of interest. Um, and it can, they can stay there totally. Or at a click, they can search beyond, or we even have nested gateways now that some people have requested, um, and allows them to, to move freely um, within this, with this domain space. So they're not, they're not 
uh, dead ends. Right. Well, I just, I think this is a very important capability because this is your tool to meet the users where they are, whether it's their area of interest, their resource of interest or whatever. And the ability to make these in a much more agile way will help us bridge that divide, bring data to communities where the data is needed. Hi, Jim, that was really excellent. I really enjoyed learning more about database. And I, I have a couple of questions about um, your development platform and the tool sharing that goes on and, and how you guys facilitate that on the, on the, the back end, I guess, to support this you know, broad international community that's yeah. collaborating here. It, it's, um, it's a bit complicated, but we've managed to navigate a lot of different spaces. Um, uh -huh. Right now, and you know, as we start to expand, because every every technology has its mm, that's the best way to describe it. They have their oddities. Mm -hmm. and they don't all <laughs> they all they all don't play well together. So what we have to wind up doing is we have to find a way to take the different technologies that exist, um, mm -hmm. ArcGIS, QGIS, Google stuff, and they're all different. And so yep. we need to find a way to standardize it into a common language. And, and to, not to degrade them at all. It's just how do we hook them all together? I'll give you a good, another good example. We had to write all the code for NetCDF files. Um, we've been hearing for years and years that the big companies are making it work, and they haven't, and it's terrible. So we just built our own NetCDF interpreter, and it works great. So when people are on database and they're reading NetCDF files in its native form, and they don't know it, and they don't care, right? They just want the stuff to work. They, they don't care how it works. They just want it to work and be uh, reliable and allow it to be inclusive. Because a lot of the problems that, and you all know this, they're becoming, it's becoming increasingly apparent to us. We need to look at things in a far more cumulative way. Um, mm -hmm. And our disciplines, we're not set up to do that. We are very uh, uh, narrow because it's become so technical and so we've become specialists. And now I'm, I'm kind of in the business of saying, okay, let's take all of that wonderful knowledge and let's bring it all back together again to see how it, how it relates to each other's things. So when the academics get in and use the system, that's what they're doing because they're bringing their own expertise in their subject domain to bear with others and coming up with some very interesting observations and, uh, and solutions to things, which is really the heart of this. I see. So you provide like a, a platform uh, workspace in which there's tool sharing that happens and yes. it's, you know, a software independent, basically. Uh, that's the way we're working on it. And we've written okay. most of the code. I mean, at, at the, right now it's running on ArcGIS server on the very bottom of it, but everything else we've written because we've had to because there's really nothing like this out there right. to do this. Um, so. Are you familiar with the, um, the AOS research workspace? No. I wasn't until recently, um, but we've got, um, yeah, the, building the collaborations has been really fun. And so, and there's always something going on and hooking up to major data libraries is another one. I mean, we, we're hooked up to ScienceBase now. So yeah. people find it on ScienceBase and pull it in. Um, it's really okay. Um, they have a huge uh, set of Python libraries that they make available to their community and other scripts. And it might be interesting for you to connect with somebody at Axiom and just, you know, do a, I don't know, swap tools or, you know, present to each other because they've got a similar vision. Excellent. Um, they're, they're less Esri focused, but I know they've, they've worked obviously quite a bit with Audubon on their, their project as well. Well, as, as time goes on, we're becoming less and less ESRI focused, and we'll always be ESRI compatible, always. But um, we don't, we're, we're not going to be ESRI dependent. We have mm -hmm. to have, we want to be able to include everybody. And sure. That's the only way we can do it. Great. Um, listen, um, we're past time, but let's just uh, call this the beginning of a conversation and uh, Jim and Max, you are hereby invited to uh, join us on the collaboration space and uh, attend future meetings. And I really hope that um, you're able to follow up and talk to the people at AU Synaxium 
Um, it was too much to try to fit them into this agenda for today, but we might have them presenting at a future meeting. So I'll make sure you get that invite as well. So um, unless there's some something else someone wants to bring up as the last point, I, I think we'll adjourn for today. We're good. Well, Great. thanks everybody. I appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for sharing. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. And I dropped a link to the, the Audubon Atlas on the AU's portal into the chat. So if people are interested, uh, find that there. Yep, and I'll make sure that all of that gets captured in the notes and we'll get those posted as soon as possible. Great, thanks again, guys. Thanks, have a great day, y'all. Happy Halloween.